a crown on his head, royal robes draped around his shoulders. He sat on the most magnificent throne you have ever seen, overlaid with gold, inlaid with ivory and onyx and pearls, six steps with statues of lions on either side. His name was Solomon, son of David, king of Israel, the wisest man the ancient world had ever known. Every day, he feasted at the king's table. Every night, he slept on his king-sized bed. (laughs) At first, he loved the pomp and circumstance. At first, he loved the perks and privileges. But you know what he really loved? What he really loved were long walks through the woods. He loved towering trees and flowering plants. He loved flying birds and swimming fish. He loved stargazing. He loved watching his trading ships sail out of harbor, and he dreamed of one day sailing with them. Now, the palace was palatial. The temple was the temple, but nature was his passion. Nature was the creator's palace, the creator's temple. And nature is when and where the king came to life. There was nothing that he did not find interesting. There was nothing that did not pique his curiosity. And so it was after one of those long walks, legs tired but mind wired, that he sat down and wrote these words, more than words, more like a manifesto. Proverbs 25, 2. It It is the glory of God to conceal things. It is the glory of kings to search things out. Now, 2,500 years after Solomon penned that proverb, Sir Francis Bacon, father of empiricism, originator of the scientific method, said this about that proverb. Solomon, although he excelled in the glory of treasure and magnificent buildings of shipping and navigation of fame and renown, yet he maketh no claim to any of those glories, but only to the glory of of inquisition of truth, as if, according to the innocent play of children, the divine majesty took delight to hide his works in the end to have them found out as if kings could not obtain a greater honor than to be God's playfellows, playfellows in that grand game. I think Sir Francis Bacon was saying that science is a game of hide and seek. We are God's playfellows. The earth is God's playground. And no one gets more excited about scientific discovery than the God of science. When we discover, wait, the earth is not flat. Wait, the earth orbits around the sun. I think God smiles. When we crack the genetic code and discover double helix DNA, I think, God, you finally figured it out. When we discover new galaxies, new subatomic particles, I think God is like a proud parent that pins the accomplishment on his refrigerator. I mean, When Neil Armstrong took one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind, I imagine that moment in heaven. God calls the angels to get, I told you, I knew they could do it. There are those who think of God as a cosmic killjoy. Nothing could be further from the truth. We are God's playfellows in a grand game of hide and seek. Now, long before the Great Commission, there was the Genesis Commission. We assume that Adam and Eve would have 
stayed in the Garden of Eden if they hadn't eaten from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, but that's not true. Genesis 1.26, God commissioned them and said, let them have dominion over the fish in the sea and the birds in the, in the sky. And then it's this all-inclusive over all the earth. What, what I'm getting at is this Genesis commission is an invitation to exploration. They could travel 24,901 miles in any direction and never see the same landscape twice. 196,949,970 square miles of terra incognita. That was a phrase repeated in the Genesis account of creation, and God saw that it was good. The English word good is the Hebrew word tov, and it means to delight. And so on day six, it's almost like God, like an artist who steps back from what they've newly painted or newly sculpted. It's almost like God steps back and says, I outdid myself. If that were theologically possible. God saw all that he had made and it was very tov. What, what I'm getting at is this, and this is really wide angle. This is really big picture. But one way we worship the creator is by enjoying, by exploring, by stewarding his creation. Amen. That could have been louder. <laughs> God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in him. I just think God created these things for us to enjoy. And so we need to do what the creator did. This is our example for life. We need to step back at the end of the day and take delight in every single day. Now, let me, let me make this personal. When, when I was in college, our basketball team was on a road trip and I don't know what got into me. What got into me? We went to a mall. I popped into a, a bookstore. And, and I bought a book. Now, I read a lot of books, but up to that point, there, there were not half a dozen books that I read that were not assigned by a teacher for a class. And so I walk in and I pick up this book. 800-page biography of Albert Einstein. And, whew, it is small font, too. <laughs> there are pages of books that can change the trajectory of our lives. And page 755, somehow I got there. <laughs> it, it said this. It said, one cannot help but be in awe when one contemplates the mysteries of eternity of life, of the marvelous structure of reality. And I want you to look at what I underlined. Can you see that, what I circled? Never lose a holy curiosity. It was like that little statement blew up in my soul. From that day to this day, I never have. I never will lose a holy curiosity. I mean, we even put it in the hallway over here at uh, the Capitol Turnaround, didn't we? Never lose a holy curiosity. There was something about the juxtaposition of those two words that just did something in me. So that same year, I'm taking a class in homiletics. And we could choose any text uh, to preach on. And, and so I could have chosen John 3.16. Could have done great commission, great commandment. I chose 1 Kings 4. <laughs> and this is what it says. The first passage I ever preached. Solomon spoke 3,000 proverbs and his songs numbered 1,005. 
He spoke about plant life from the cedar of Lebanon to the hyssop that grows out of walls. And so we gather from this text that Solomon is a student of a species of trees called the cedar of Lebanon. Now, it's known for its longevity and resiliency. This is interesting. It takes 30 years for that tree to flower, so it's a late bloomer, but it can live to a 1,000 years. The trunk can grow to a diameter of six feet. It can reach a height of 120 feet. But what I find most fascinating is that there's a chemical compound in the cedar of Lebanon that repels snakes. So if you're in the woods taking a walk and you want to take a nap, highly recommend the cedar of Lebanon. Fun fact. When it came time for Solomon to build his temple, he did not use trees that were native to Israel. He struck a deal with the king of Tyre, and he had cedars of Lebanon actually shipped down the Mediterranean Sea, and that's what he used to build his temple. And you can say to me, what difference does that make? And I would say to you, evidently, there's a God to whom those details actually matter. And if they matter to God, maybe they should matter to us. But wait, there's more. Solomon also spoke about animals and birds, reptiles and fish, from all nations, people came to listen to Solomon's wisdom sent by all the kings of the world who had heard of his wisdom. Uh, Solomon was a poet, was a singer, song writer, was a botanist, was a dendrologist, was an ornithologist, was an ichthyologist. He was all of these things. Now, theologically speaking, there are two kinds of revelation, general and special. We believe the Bible to be the inspired word of God. You don't just read it. It reads you. It's living and active. It's useful for teaching and correcting and training in righteousness. And scripture is our final authority when it comes to matters of faith and doctrine. Now, having said that, I'll say this. Don't discount general revelation. I think that's an insult to the creator. When we make a distinction between secular and sacred, it's a false dichotomy. All truth is God's truth. Every ology is a branch of theology. There is something to learn from everything. I want us to have that Posture as people who follow Jesus, as people who love God. Like, I want us to have that posture. Romans 1.20 says, since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made. Elizabeth Barrett Browning said, the whole earth is crammed with heaven and every bush of fire with God. But only he who notices takes off his shoes. The rest of us sit around and pluck blackberries. We're going to take off our shoes today. Is that okay? So a few weeks ago, I'm rabbit trailing during my devotional time. I come across this psalm that is celebrating the creativity of God and the variety in nature. And it says, Psalm 104... The ocean is vast and wide, teeming with creatures large and small. Then it says this, the ships go to and fro and the Leviathan, which you formed to frolic. And that's what blew up in my spirit as I read, wait a second. And so I start looking at other translations. Other translations say, made to have fun. Other translations say made to sport, made to play. 
And I start thinking to myself, maybe praying and playing aren't that different after all. That maybe we shouldn't just pray like it depends on God. Maybe we should play like it depends on God. We have a theology of fun in it. Enjoy the journey. Like, can we just suck the joy out of life? Let's squeeze the juice. Every single day, miracles all around us all the time. All work and no play. Makes Jack a dull boy. Can I tell you what I told a bunch of preachers this week? I said, if your sermons are boring, it's probably because your life is boring. I said, you don't need to get a sermon. You need to get a life. Love you. You need to get a life. God has been delighting in his creation since day one. Go thou and do likewise. Proverbs 6.6. 6. It's probably not anybody's life verse, um, but it's one of my favorite Proverbs. It's obscure, but that doesn't make it any less inspired or any less true. Solomon said, go to the ant Study her ways and be wise. I think that goes for ants and whales and everything in between. Okay, I learned something a few weeks ago, and I don't know why I'm scratching. I don't feel like I'm doing anything. What is that? Just bear with me. I mean, I'll just, I'll just, we'll just. Look it out if we need to. Um, I'm going to keep using, no, uh, I want to keep using this because I, I need my hands. <laughs> I learned something a few weeks ago online, online. This is going to blow your mind. Ready? When cows sense a storm coming, they instinctively move in the opposite direction. If a storm is coming from the west, they will move, if they're in a large pasture, towards the east. The problem with that is this. They actually prolong the effects of the storm by moving with it. Buffalo do the exact opposite. They somehow instinctively know you don't run away from storms, you run toward them. Why? Because you can't outrun a storm. Do we have a picture? Do we have a picture of the buffalo? Is it just too good not to? We have a picture of the buffalo. I know we do. A picture's worth a thousand words. And when it appears on the screen. <laughs> oh, man. We may not. We do, but we may not. It's this picture of a buffalo like covered in ice that obviously has been moving into the storm. You cannot run from the storm. You have to run through the storm. All of us live from metaphor, yes? I think what I'm saying is go study the buffalo and be wise. Some of us are cows trying to run away from our problems and then we wonder why they never get solved. I think we'd be a lot better. We'd get to the other side of a lot more problems if we just went into it. I guess what I'm trying to say is you need counseling. I've never met anybody that doesn't need counseling for something. So get counseling, find a friend, um, but move into, move into it. Um, Jesus said, so I think what's true of animals is true of plants. Kind of stick with me. Jesus said, consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. Like, is he not doing what Solomon did? And then he tips his cap to Solomon and says, not even Solomon in all his splendor was arrayed like one of these. I think Jesus is advocating a holy curiosity towards all of life. Last year, read... 
Wynn Collier's biography of Eugene Peterson. And I just share this because I think we want to put on our walls what is meaningful. The Jewish idea is mezuzah. Read Deuteronomy 6, and they would actually take the Shema, put it in a parchment box, and put it on their doorpost. In other words, um, and, and artists will love this, that you surround yourself with meaningful things. And so Eugene Peterson, I might, I probably need to, because I love you more than my hands. Um, just kidding. I, I kind of love this, and I'm going to ask a question at the end of this. Eugene Peterson hung three pictures in his study. Now, he pastored Bel Air Presbyterian for like 30 years, wrote 30 books in his spare time, paraphrased uh, the message. So he hung three pictures in his study. One was John Henry Newman, who inspired his philosophy of ministry. Another one was Barrick Friedrich von Hugel, who influenced his love of language. And then a Scottish preacher named Alexander White. For 20 years on Sunday mornings, Eugene Peterson would read one of Alexander White's sermons before preaching his own. So my question is, whose three portraits would you put in your study? Who are the, the three people that have left their fingerprints on your soul? Now, I, I think, and this would be so hard. It would be so hard. But I, I think George Washington, George Washington Carver would be one of them for me. So like Solomon, Carver would take long walks in the wood. His regular routine was getting up at 4 a.m. Now realize, he was born a slave. He was orphaned at a few weeks old. And he had a hard time getting an education because of the color of his skin. But he had a holy curiosity that could not be stopped. And so he would get up at 4 a.m. in the morning. And he would take these long prayer walks through the woods. And his life verse was Job 12, 7. Ask the animals and they will teach you. Or the birds of the air, they will teach you. Speak to the earth, and it will teach you. And Carver took it literally. Sometimes I wonder if there were just three verses that we're taking very figuratively, that we actually took more literally, if it wouldn't just radically change our lives. So he would literally speak to the earth. He said, God, reveal the mysteries of nature now, you know the rest of the story. Innovated more than 300 uses for the peanut, right? From soap to insecticides to shaving cream to the secret ingredient in Batterson burgers. <laughs> Worcestershire shosh. <laughs> Say it five times fast. Well, how do we cultivate this kind of holy curiosity? Let me just park mobile for a minute. Three things. One, keep asking questions. Now, in the Gospels, Jesus is asked, give or take, 186 questions, but he asks 307 questions. What I find fascinating about that is this. He knew all the answers. And yet, for some reason, asked more questions than he was asked. Asked more questions then he answered. I think if we approached our problems, approached people with more holy curiosity. I, I, and I'm not talking in a vacuum. When, when Laura got that first diagnosis of cancer, and we're, we're on the other side of two bouts. I want to say that every time in case you're just tuning, tuning in. Yeah, you can clap for that. Read a piece of poetry that posed the question, what have you come to teach me? I just think that's the only, that's the buffalo approach. That's like, we're going to fight through this. We're going to see what God has to teach us. We're going to get to the other side. According to Rawl Smith, kids ask on average 125 questions a day. Parents, can I get a... 
Adults ask on average six questions. So somewhere between childhood and adulthood, we lose 119 questions per day. When Jesus said you must become like little children, I think part of what that means is let's get back a few of those questions. When Jesus said ask, seek, and knock, those are present imperative verbs. Keep seeking, keep knocking, keep asking. The more you know, the more you know how much you don't know. 2 Corinthians 8, 2, he who thinks he knows does not yet know as he ought to know. Don't take yes for an answer. Keep learning, keep growing. And, and then two, keep a journal. So keep asking questions, but keep a journal. So uh, Catherine Cox did this fascinating biographical survey of 3,000 of history's greatest geniuses and discovered one common denominator amongst them. From Da Vinci to Benji Franklin uh, to Henry David Thoreau, all of them kept, uh, recorded their thoughts and feelings, ideas and insights, observations and reflections in one kind of journal or another. See, here's the problem, and this is where, like, I, I don't know if this is what you expected when you came to church this weekend, when you dialed in online. Like, I don't know if this is what you expected, but Da Vinci said that the average human looks without seeing, listens without hearing, touches without feeling, eats without tasting, inhales without awareness of fragrance, and talks without thinking. So what I'm saying is it's just this, this holy curiosity towards life, but the shortest pencil is longer than the longest memory. Take every thought captive, 2 Corinthians 10, 5, and make it obedient to Christ. So you're asking questions. You're taking notes. Um, Here's, here's um, oh, I almost need that camera back. But here, here's like just a journal, a journal page. So what I do, um, and I, this is a dream journal, prayer journal, gratitude journal. Um, you can't read it, but you can kind of see what I'm talking about. So I use different color pens. I'll write things down, and then um, I may circle it, or I may asterisk it. And then when I finish a journal, then I go back and I double journal. If it's something that I cannot afford to forget this, I double journal it. So keep a journal. And then keep reading. Now listen, prioritize the word of God. Daily Bible reading plan. I just think it's so critical. There's just no substitute for it. Um, Pavlov said if you want new ideas, read old books. No book older or better than the Bible. Um, read a book years ago, Mozart's Brain and the Fighter Pilot. Interesting title. Author said this. Our perceptions take on richness and depth as a result of all the things we learn. What the eye sees is determined by what the brain has learned. And then says this. Learn more, see more. Learn more, see more. Learn more, see more. Next time you go to Yellowstone, Hill family, next time you go to Yellowstone, you see those buffalo, you see those bison, you're going to remember this message. You're going to go into the storm, right? It's, it's about learning from anything and everything. <laughs> Miracles still happen. Oh. All right, we got to keep going, we got to keep going, we got to keep going. Let me, uh, let me try to, don't get too excited, but let me try to close. When, when I was a freshman at the University of Chicago, um, well, two things happened. One, I'll just say this for the record, I discovered that I knew what I believed, but I didn't know why I believed what I believed. And when my faith came under some attack by some really smart professors, what I had to do is deconstruct what I believed and then reconstruct why I believe what I believe. 
And just so you know, I've gone through that process many, many times. It's ongoing. There is no finish line. You never arrive. None of us is omniscient. You just kind of keep learning, keep growing, and, uh, and you stay humble and stay hungry. And, and God teaches us. Um, but there was one moment, I, I, I took a class in immunology at the University of Chicago Hospital Center. And it still ranks as my favorite class all time. I, I don't know if my professor believed in intelligent design. But I felt like every lecture was an exegesis of Psalm 139 that we are fearfully and wonderfully made. And so hold, hold that thought. I want to do two things in closing. Uh, one... Take a deep breath and let it out. Every breath we take, 12.5 sextillion molecules that we inhale in that half liter of air. That's more sand than all the sand. That's more molecules than all the sand and all the seashores on earth. Every single breath. Now, oh man, this is where I needed the other mic. Take your two fingers and put it on your wrist and the wrist and take your pulse. Just you should feel, I hope. <laughs> you should feel the echo of a heartbeat. That's evidence that your heart is beating. And what is it doing? It's pumping six quarts of blood through 60,000 miles of veins and arteries and capillaries. With every breath you take, oxygen is inhaled. It's absorbed into the bloodstream through a process called diffusion. And then almost like a hitchhiker, it's picked up by hemoglobin. You have 25 trillion red blood cells coursing through your body and every single red blood cell has 260 million proteins called hemoglobin that delivers oxygen to every cell in your body and so my question is this when was the last time you thanked God for hemoglobin I remember walking out of that class praising God for hemoglobin. Oh God, we are fearfully and wonderfully made. There are only two ways to live your life, said Albert Einstein. One is as if nothing is a miracle. The other is as if everything is. So what I'm advocating this weekend is not too complicated. It's just a holy curiosity towards everyone and everything. But I feel like I've focused on everything. And so let me close with everyone. Laura and I have a counselor that we've seen off and on for many years for lots of different things. And she's brilliant. Uh, she's a family systems therapist. And that means you're going to talk a lot about family of origin. You're going to talk about emotional ecosystem. You're going to talk about triangulation. You're going to talk about adaptive strategies. And like every session, there's just something. Like I, I have my journal, I'm taking notes, but man, it was, it was not too long ago. She said something that, whoo, I've been thinking about ever since. We were talking about parenting. And Dr. Murray Bowen is the godfather of family systems therapy. And he was once asked, what makes a great mother? But I think this goes for fathers. And, and what he said was, great parents have a non-anxious curiosity about their kids. At which point I think Laura and I turned to each other and said, crap. <laughs> we had kids when we were kids. We were way too anxious. And the problem with that is this, our ungoverned anxiety, we, we either, we absorb it and project it. And so, I don't care if we're talking about your, your spouse or your kids, your friends, your colleagues, your classmates, people you love and people you love less. <laughs> I, 
I just think a, a non-anxious curiosity. And I'm, I'm going to close with an idea. I, I had never even said this publicly. And then a few weeks ago, um, I, I was recording a podcast with Bob Goff. Now, Bob Goff has been here, and Bob Goff is one of my favorite humans on the planet. And I think he, bring, he pulls crazy out of you. Like he pulls ideas that things you've never thought of because Bob is Bob. And so we're having this conversation, and, and I just floated this idea. But the more I think about it, um, we're going to put a picture up of me. I, I think... <laughs> Mark, open your mouth when you smile. <laughs> You'll remember this. I think all of us should carry around a picture of our five-year-old self. When, when you meet someone, it's like opening a book to page 117 and starting to read. If you haven't read page 5 or page 17 or page 72, you're going to form a lot of opinions about the people that you encounter. You're going to judge a book by its cover. You're going to thin slice one little moment and then just assume this is who they are. How is it that Jesus could not, not, not defend what the woman did who was caught in the act of... He didn't defend it. He said, go, go and sin no more. He didn't defend it. But, but when the religious leaders wanted to stone her to death, it's almost like Jesus said, you can stone her over my dead body. And I think it's because Jesus saw the five-year-old girl. We do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. We, has, we have one who has been tempted in every way as we are. He loves the five-year-old you. He loves the baby you. He loves the big you. He loves the yesterday you. He loves the tomorrow you. He loves you. You. And, and Maury Schwartz, remember that book, Tuesdays with Maury? By, by the way, I still remember that page. It's what I underline and circle. I am every age up to my own. And so are you. All of us, these books, these jigsaw puzzles. I guess, yeah, we'll close with this. May, may God give us a non-anxious curiosity towards everything. And may God give us a non-anxious curiosity towards everyone. In Jesus' name, amen.